If the Lord heard your voice, if the Bible says God heard your voice, guess what's going to happen next? What do you think happens? What do you think happens when you got the ear of the almighty God? When you have got God's attention, when you have spoken to the creator of the universe, the master planner who set up your life before you even got here, what do you think happens when he hears you? Thank you, Jesus. You ain't got nothing to worry about. You ain't got nothing to worry about. You ain't got nothing to worry about. God has power that he want to show you. God has power that he wants the, all of the earth to know that God is your God and he's your king. Thank you, Jesus. Bless your holy name. There's nothing better than worshiping God. There's nothing more important. If you don't get a chance to do anything this week, take time out to worship your God, worship your King, worship your God. Do you want God to use you? That's a question for everybody listening to me tonight. Do you want God to use you? Do you want your God to use you? Isaiah 54 verse four says, read this with me. Fear not, for you shall not be ashamed, neither be confused. But you shall not be put to shame. For you will. You're going to. It's going to happen. You will forget the shame of your childhood. And you shall not. You shall not remember the disappointment of what you're currently going through anymore. This is the Bible. This is what God said. Water is essential. Soft. Does no harm. We need it for inside our bodies and thank God we need it for outside our bodies. Is, is it okay for a person to be afraid of water? Bananas, as you know, is rich in potassium amongst other things. They can help lower your blood sugar and can help your digestive system. Other than a banana peel on the floor, is it okay to be afraid of a banana? Taxis was essential before ride sharing came about. Does it make sense to be afraid of them? Do you know anybody, do you know any person that freezes when they see a cab? If you get the great idea to try to throw me in any body of water, you'll have the biggest struggle of your life on your hands. I highly suggest against it. If you try to get me to eat a banana, I will not be responsible for cleaning up the vomit. It's your fault. Thank you, Jesus. If you try to get me inside of a cab, I will physically fight you with every fiber of my being. This is a very bad idea. Not sure how old I was, but I remember my father trying to trick me into eating a banana. Then I later found out, he later told me in my adult years, that that banana had medication in it. And I remember vomiting and I, I subconsciously vowed to never eat a banana again. When I was seven years old in the Caribbean Sea of Jamaica, I remember watching my parents. They were playing in the water, splashing water on each other, laughing and giggling. And I remember the exact moment while they splashing water on each other, playing and having a grand time. I remember making a decision. Should I scream one more time to try to get their attention? Even though I'm too far away that they would hear me. I had floated so far off. The waves were taking me so off, so far away they haven't noticed. Should I take my last breath and use that last breath to live a little bit longer? Or should I waste it calling for help? Although they can't hear me. I remember nine years old being in the back seat of a cab, crying as this drunken cab driver sped down the street, trying to escape my brothers who's trying to rescue me. Why did these things happen to me? Why did God allow this? What did I do? to deserve dying and having to be revived again? What did I do to, to deserve the trauma of vomiting on my clothes at a, a certain age, a small age? Or what did I do to have to be rescued at nine years old from a kidnapper? From only God knows what his plans was or what he wanted to do. God told Jeremiah, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, said the Lord. Thoughts of peace. This is what God is thinking about you. He has thoughts of peace, not of evil. And God has thoughts to give you an expected end. He's already planned out your end. I'm not delusional. I do not think anything I've ever had to deal with is anywhere comparable to the adverse situations anybody else had to survive. We live in a cruel, heartless world. This world we live in is full of selfish, mean, perverted, 
demented, wicked, evil people. And because of the actions of humans that are influenced by evil spirits, Jeremiah said, when I would try to comfort myself, when I would try to give myself some comfort against my sorrow, my joy is gone. My heart is sick within me. Jeremiah said, I have determined my sorrow, the sorrow that I have in my heart cannot be healed. You are not the first person to get mad at God. You are not the first person that feels like giving up. It's a trick. It's a deception. Within your sorrow, you develop the thought that what I'm going through or what I went through was unique. Nobody else had to deal with this. This is only me. And this type of thinking will make you forget that there are people currently that got it way worse than you. People will leave you to believe that the natural emotion of anger towards God is wrong or uncommon. It's not wrong. It's not uncommon. Jeremiah said, I'm not going to talk about God anymore. This is God's prophet. So I ain't going to talk about him. No. I'm not even going to mention him. I'm never going to preach. I'm never going to prophesy in his name. Sound like he's upset. Do you think your existence started here? Do you think your essence ends here? Do you really think your birth date was when you were created? No, your birthday is only your entrance into this world. God told Jeremiah, look here, little boy, while you're complaining or you're carrying on. Before I formed you in the belly, you thought your daddy formed you. You thought your mom created you. God said, I formed you and I knew you before I formed you. And before you came out your mama's stomach, I sanctified you and I ordained you a prophet unto the nations. Before you came out of the womb, Jeremiah, those of you listening to me, I had a purpose for you. How is it possible that God can have a purpose for you before you even get in, in your mother's womb? So Jeremiah responds to God telling him, God telling him, you're not just here. God is telling him that nobody is a mistake. That's what this means. Nobody is a mistake. God is telling him, I put the soul in the womb. I plan your life. I'm in control. Choose the family and I choose your pain. The family that you are in, I chose that family for you. And I also chose your destiny. So Jeremiah responds with his failures. He points out his deficiency. He brings up his insecurities as if God cares. He complains to God with what he thinks he can't do. You, Jeremiah, you are the one, one of the few people that learned their destiny firsthand directly from God and God made it plain. Those of you listening to me today, those of you under the sound of my voice, do you think God made a mistake? Do you think he picked the wrong person? Nikki, do you think he chose the wrong set of circumstances, the wrong set of things that would develop you? God doesn't make mistakes. When, when did God ever choose a person that we think he should have chose? We always choose people that we think is great, but God does the complete opposite. He always chooses people that society labels as defective. Judah brought prostitutes. That's Judah. Rahab was a prostitute. And these are Jesus' bloodline family members. This is Jesus' ancestors. One person buying a prostitute, great-great-grandmother, was a prostitute. Moses stuttered. Remember old cousin Peter? Had a bad temper. Adam had a wicked heart. Sarah was a liar. Saul was disobedient. Jesus picked someone. Jesus picked someone. Remember that guy Jesus picked? They had the straight-up devil in him. But it was still necessary for him to pick that guy because God still got the glory. Somebody had to betray him, right? Sister Ebony, God chooses misfits and people with problems. That's how he works. He chooses those that have been refused and carry shame and have broken hearts and adverse childhoods. Have you gone through enough to qualify for God to have chosen you? Remember when Saul was knocked off his horse and God blinded him? Okay. Why was it necessary for him to be blinded? He had to be led around by his hand like a child. 
If God is going to use him to write 66% of the New Testament and preach the gospel to Israelites all over the world, why then is it necessary for him to be blind as a bat first? Why did Paul have to be blind first? In Acts 13.8, it says there was a sorcerer named Elymas. He tried to stop Barnabas and Saul. He tried to turn away the very person that they came to preach to. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, he set his eyes on him. Paul said, oh, full of all cunning and craftiness. You think you're slick. You full of mischief. You child of the devil. You enemy of all righteousness. Will you ever stop perverting the ways of the Lord? No, Paul, the devil will never stop. That's his job. Paul said, and now, watch this. The hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind. Enjoy not seeing the sun for a season. The Bible says, and immediately fell on him a mist and darkness. And he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Wait, where did we hear that before? Lead him by the hand. So Paul used the same adverse thing to combat a sorcerer. Paul used what used to be his pain, you see what's going on here? And he turned it into power. What if Paul was never blinded? Nothing just happens. Tell somebody with the stuff I've been through, you better not mess with me. Because when I get converted, God gonna give me power. In a little while, God is gonna use my childhood, God is gonna use my PTSD, to empower me. Do you see what happened? You see what happened here? You see, do you see the, the correlation from Paul being blind? Do you see what happened? How would you deal with a sorcerer? What fate should a sorcerer suffer who's trying to stop you from preaching the gospel? Paul, who was blind through the power of God, blinds a sorcerer. Paul said, I know the pain of what being, I know what it's like to be blind. God suffered me to be blind, but now I have the power for warfare. Out of all the things that Paul could have done to him, the power that he used came from his trauma. Rihanna, God can turn it around. You may not see it yet, but this makes you, this makes you more powerful. This made you more powerful. Ideally, normally, you're an adult much longer than you're a child. All parents, listen to me carefully. Teach your children to have fun. Don't let them grow up too quick. What does it take for a person to overcome their short childhood? Their relatively short childhood compared to their long adulthood. What does it take for adverse situations to be become distant memories? What does it take for the things that you went through just to be a memory and not control you or rule you? What would it take for a child to grow up in poverty or having to fight every day or having to deal with identity issues? What would it take for a child to overcome being molested or touched inappropriately? Is it possible to reach a state of content? Philippians 4.11, not that I speak in respect of want, but I have learned. This is something you have to learn. I have learned whatever state I am, whatever state I am, therewith, in that state, to be content. He told Timothy, and having food and clothes, let us be content with that. If you got food, if you got clothes, say thank you, Jesus. There was a man named Joachim. The Bible says he married a woman named Susanna, a very good looking woman, and one that feared the Lord. What does it mean when the Bible says one that feared the Lord? It means this is a person who kept God's commandments. This is a person who did what they were supposed to do. The Bible says her parents also were righteous and taught their daughter according to the law of Moses. All right. In verse number four, I'm sorry, verse number five, the Bible talks about her husband who was a rich man. He had a nice, huge garden on the side of the house. A lot of important people hung out at their house. Earlier that year, there were two judges appointed. These two judges, or leaders of the community, supposed to be righteous men. These two men, they hung out at their house. They hung out there often. The Bible says people came over in the morning, handled some business, and by noon, they was out of there. Now, when the people departed away at noon, Susanna went to her husband's garden to walk, enjoying her day, catching the breeze, living life, ain't bothering nobody. The Bible says, and two dirty, nasty, stinking elders watched her go into the garden every day 
for a walk so that their lust was inflamed toward her. Oh, nasty, good for nothing old man. And they perverted the, their own minds. This perversion did not come from God. Where did it come from? The devil? They put nasty desires in their own mind and stopped looking towards heaven. Nor did they remember that their job was to judge righteously. The lust they put in their own mind clouded their judgment. They just got promoted this year. But because of your own lust that you never dealt with, lust will destroy you. This lust that you never dealt with, you forgot you were working for God. If you don't deal with your lust, marriage doesn't fix lust. You have to get down on the inside of that and root it out. That doesn't go away. It builds. You forgot you were born with an assignment from God that had an expected end. Isn't that what he told Jeremiah? The Bible says in Susanna chapter 1 verse 10, And although they were both wounded with her love, I can't, these nasty, yet neither one of them wanted to show the other one his grief. They fell so much in love with a married woman that they had grief. These dirty, no good, give me a name to call these evil men. They were so in love with her, the Bible says they were wounded and grieved. And they didn't want the other person to know that they were heartbroken because of their own lust. The Bible says the stuff they wanted to do to her, they were ashamed. Wait, 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 wait. I thought you were just looking and not touching. I thought it was okay to just look and not touch. You see what happens? How did you get to wanting to do stuff to her from just looking? How did that happen? Well, how did we get here? Verse 12 says they watched diligently every day to see her. Every day. And the one said to the other, yo, dude, check this out. Let us go home because it's dinner time, okay? I thought they normally leave at noon. What are they still doing there until dinner time? So he said, all right, dude, I'm out. Holler at you tomorrow. Got to go take care of some important business anyway. I got some important cases to work on tomorrow. So I'll see you in the morning. All right, they roll out. So when, when they were both gone out, they parted one from the other and they both bend the block. They both drove around the block. They came back around and they both of them pulled up back up the crib. And they asked each other, yo, yo, what you doing here? Thought you had to leave. The Bible said that's when they finally acknowledged their lust. So these nasty men that's supposed to be protecting the women in the community, they set up a time that they can get together and find her alone. So they watched every day to find the perfect time. The one hot day, she wanted to take a shower in the garden. So she went in as she normally do with her two maids only. Hot day, take a shower, no problem. There's a gate, there's nobody can get in. Nobody there, so she thought. So she thought it was safe to take a shower. Those two perverted elders, those two perverts, they hid and they watched her. They were already in there, they went inside first. So then she said to her maids, all right, can y'all go get me some oil and some washing balls and make sure you shut the garden doors so I can take a shower. Little did she know that these two poor virtues were already inside. They just locked them in. So the Bible says now when the maids were gone out, the two elders rose up and they ran unto her saying, in verse 20, look, the garden doors are shut. Nobody can see us. We're in love with you. Therefore, consent unto us and have sex with us. They so wicked. They know what they were doing is bad. But they wanted to later on be able to say she consented. See how evil they are? If you will not have sex with us, they said, we're going to lie on you. We're going to say you had a guy in here with you. And that's the reason you sent your two maids away. And we the judges. We the judges that have to take your case. What are you going to do? So Susanna sighed. Oh, man. She said, I'm jacked up on every side. I'm between a rock and a hard place. If I do this thing that they want me to do, it's death unto me. And if I don't do it, I still got to deal with these jokers. Because you're the judges. And I cannot escape your hands. There's no way out of this for me. So she said, it's better for me to fall into your hands and not do it 
than to sin in the sight of the Lord. When Susanna cried out with a loud voice, help! Guess what the elders did? They started screaming against her. And this is what we need. We need men to rise up in our community and protect our women. Everybody should say amen. We need our men to rise up and protect our women. Somebody should be typing amen. Verse 26, it says, So when the servants of the house heard the cry in the garden, they rushed in at the private door to see what was done unto her. She must have been screaming louder than the two men. She must have been screaming for her life, as she should. So the two men came up with a lie. How did they come up with a lie so quick? So that they... They came up with a lie so if, they, if she was found guilty, they came up with a lie so that she would get the death penalty. What? It says, and it came to pass the next day when the people were assembled to her husband, Joachim, the two elders came also full of mischievous imaginations against Susanna to give her the death penalty. They have a whole plan of how they're going to kill her. How did we get here? What exactly did Susanna do to deserve death? The Bible says she was a righteous woman. And look what God is about to allow people. Look what God is about to allow to happen to her. They accused her of adultery because they know that adultery carried the death penalty. So when you skip down to verse 37 to save time, they lied and said that they saw a young man. We saw him hiding. And then we saw him come in and we saw him have sex with her. Can we put a whole line? Verse 39 says, and when we saw them together, we, they lied and said they saw them together. We tried to catch him, but that joker was too strong. He opened the door and he ran out. Couldn't catch him. Can you imagine you standing in court? Can you imagine hearing this? And you know it's pointless to even respond. What you gonna say? Can you imagine her husband and her family? They, they just can't believe that she would do this. But they have to believe what the elders are saying. You're not going to go against the righteous men of God, right? The Bible says, then the assembly believed them because they were the elders and judges of the people. So they sentenced her to death. In verse 42, the Bible says, then Susanna cried out with a loud voice and said, oh, everlasting God that knoweth the secrets and knoweth all things before they be. That's important. She knew that God knows what happens before it happens. And here is the solution to all of life's problems. Here is the goal to everything that you've ever had to deal with. Talk to God. Get God to hear you. Let him hear your voice. The Bible says she cried out to God. She got God to hear her voice. And I come to tell you tonight, all of your childhood pain. Some of the horrible things that you had to endure, let God hear you. The Bible says, and the Lord heard her voice. I don't care what you have to do this week. Let God hear your voice. You can continue to talk to your therapist if you want to, that's fine. You can continue to talk to your pastor if you want to, that's fine. But when the Bible says, and the Lord heard her voice, I get excited. Because ain't nothing going to happen bad now. If the Lord heard your voice, if the Bible says God heard your voice, guess what's going to happen next? What do you think happens? What do you think happens when you got the ear of the almighty God? When you have got God's attention, when you have spoken to the creator of the universe, the master planner who set up your life before you even got here, what do you think happens when he hears you? Thank you, Jesus. You ain't got nothing to worry about. You ain't got nothing to worry about. You ain't got nothing to worry about. I can't wait to see what happens when God hears your voice. You think it's over, but did God hear you? What happened in your life is final and cannot be changed. We have to accept that. But while you think it's over, while you think there was no purpose, it was God that formed you in your mama's belly for a reason. Don't stop here. Don't pause at your pain. Keep moving and while you moving god is moving in verse 45 the bible says therefore when she was led to be put to death they ain't waste no time she's out of here at that same time when they start carrying her out i can imagine that she just knows hey this is it for me waving goodbye to her family they're carrying her out she didn't even have a chance did you notice she said nothing to them she started talking directly to god 
She lived a life where she knew if I opened my mouth, my God will hear me because he's forever present with me. If you have God down on the inside, if you've ever been filled with the power of the Holy Ghost, he's forever present with you and he hears you. He's listening to you. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, talk to him. Tell him, God, I need your help. I want you to come into my life. I want you to take up residency here. I want you to rule, rest, and abide here. Oh, God, I need you. You need to talk to God and tell him to forgive me for every single solitary thing that I've ever done. And God, everything that happened in my life, I know you were in full control at all times. The Bible says when she was led to be put to death. At the same time, the Lord raised up the Holy Spirit of a young man whose name was Daniel. Yeah, that same Daniel. Daniel proved that these two men was lying. I don't have time to go through the details of it. You can read this. For, it's just one chapter in Suzanne. Daniel was honored by King Nebuchadnezzar and he was placed in authority over all the wise men of the kingdom. Daniel went and got three of his friends, his countrymen, his family members, and he put them in charge of stuff. It's not about you. Thank you, KK. God's got a bigger plan and he chose you to be a part of it. You see what happened? If it wasn't for Susanna, Daniel would have never been put in this position. Look at what you're able to handle. Look at what you're able to survive. Think about it. Everything that you went through, you survived. Anybody else, somebody else would have buckled under pressure. Somebody else would have gave up. And instead, you're about to enter into the best season of your life. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 62, the Bible says, and according to the law of Moses, Daniel convinced the council. And they did unto them, because the Bible says that if you try to accuse somebody of something, whatever the penalty for that person was, you got to suffer that penalty. Daniel convinced the council and they did the same thing to these wicked judges. The same thing that these two wicked judges maliciously intended to do to Susanna as the law required. And they put those two evil men to death. That's how the innocent blood was saved that day. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I'm not sorry that you had to go through this ordeal, Susanna, because we needed you to do this to get rid of these two wicked judges. God used you to get rid of two wicked judges that nobody else could take down. Years of trying to build a case against these guys, these perverted rapists, God was able to get them destroyed and God condemned them with their own mouth. Who can do that? This is the power of the almighty God. How many times have these men have already done this? How many times would they have gotten away with it? How many women would have been raped? Was it worth it? God doesn't work the way we want him to work. We may never understand his methods. But if God chooses you, and if he chooses to use you, then he also chooses to bless you. It had to happen. But God will get the glory, and your enemies will be judged by God. Everything that happened to you, everything that you had to go through, God is going to judge all of your enemies. I promise you that. In verse 64, from that day forth was Daniel in great reputation in the sight of the people. Would we even have the book of Daniel? Would Daniel ever be exalted if it wasn't for Susanna? Would Daniel ever be a prophet? All of the things that Daniel did, would that even ever happen if it wasn't for Susanna? Thank you, Jesus. The Bible says, and who knows whether or not you have come into the kingdom for such a time as this. Who knows? If you didn't come, what day does God really plan to use you? It, it doesn't start today. It started when he placed you in your mama's womb. God put you there for a reason, for a time such as this, for him to use you. He haven't forgotten about you and he's going to use you. He need you. Thank you, Jesus. Do you know why Susanna had to go through this? Do you know why Esther had to go through almost seeing her entire nation being killed? She was placed in the kingdom for this. Sometimes it's not about you. Thank you, sweet pea. Thank you, Jesus. You know why God allowed me to drown when I was seven years old in the Caribbean Sea? Do you know why I was kidnapped at nine years old by a taxi driver? Nobody will ever know. But you know what? It really don't matter because I overcame it. I went and I learned how to swim. Just water. When you go through these adverse situations, God puts something down on the inside that says, never again. You know why the cab driver tried to kidnap me? I don't know. Don't matter. 
because a lot of women can defend themselves now because I became an advocate for them. And I also made sure that all my kids learned how to swim before they were seven years old. Turn your pain into power. You can overcome. God was always in control. I understand people hurt you because humans are created with a wicked heart. People are cruel. And I know it's hard to talk about it because you don't want the world to know. But the best way to tell the world is to become super overcoming, to be a super overcomer, to turn your pain into power. If your parents were mean to you, be super nice to your kids. If you got called names when you was growing up, increase your vocabulary. Don't blame yourself. Did you know trauma can stay in your body and affect your entire life until you process it out? It's time to rewrite your story with self-care. Susanna was about to be murdered. Those two corrupt judges wrote her story, but now we're reading the story that she wrote while they're dead. She's powerful. She survived trauma. And that's a fact, and it's impossible to take that away from her. You can't take that power away from her now. You can never take that power away from you from the trauma that you survived. You're powerful. What is the message from your childhood? Talking to you. Talking to you. What is the message from you? We got to figure it out because the message is tied to your destiny. Are you going to discover your destiny? Are you going to discover your purpose in the kingdom? Are you going to find out your life plan from the world? Or are you going to find it out from the word? Are you going to find out your destiny and your life plan and the reason you're here? Are you going to find that out from the world? Or are you going to find it out from the word of God, from being in his presence? What if, what if God really does know about it? What if God really did know you before he formed you in your mother's womb, just like the Bible says, and ordained you for such a time as this in his kingdom right before he returned? What if God is going to use you and you're going to be instrumental right before he comes back? Nothing just happens. Nothing just, can y'all say nothing just happens? Nothing just happens. You still focus on it shouldn't happen. My life should have went this way or this should have been better or that should have, that should have been me over there. But what if you aren't listening to me tonight by accident? What if God sent you here for a reason? to get you to start thinking about turning it around. I, I know that life is hard. Why is life so hard? Why, why does being alive require so much pain? Why am I not allowed to give up? Once you're walking in your destiny, once you, you, you power through your trauma, life will no longer be hard. Congratulations on surviving the worst season of your life. Let's move forward together. You know what forward means? Forward means talking to God. Forward means FaceTime with God. Forward means challenge yourself. Learn how to swim. Learn how to play an instrument. Become an advocate. Or go work for a group that has somebody struggling with what you survived. What do you think about that? Whatever you survived, take that pain and turn it into power. And go advocate for somebody else who's going through the same thing. That's how you turn pain into power. That's how you turn your adverse childhood into a triumphant adulthood. Samaya, fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed. Read this with me again. Neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame. For thou shalt forget the shame of your childhood. And you're not going to remember the reproach of your widowhood anymore. Verse 6, for the Lord had called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit. He didn't wait to call you when you got it all together. He called you when you were forsaken. He called you when your spirit was attacked. It says he called you even, he called you as a wife, even from your youth. This is a master builder that God is. He called you when everybody else refused you. Your God says he wants you. Everything is part of the plan. Verse seven. For a small moment have I forsaken you. What you went through was temporary and God says I knew all about it. But with great mercies, God is going to have so much mercy on you. Hear my voice. When he picks you up and he draws you close, don't despise humble beginnings. Don't hate your past. Look forward to God's mercy. Verse 10 says, for the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed. 
God said, but my kindness shall not depart from you. That's the word of God. Dwell on that tonight. Neither shall the covenant of peace be removed. Said the Lord that has mercy on you. That's your scripture tonight. Verse 17 says, no weapon that is formed against me shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, wicked old men, you're going to condemn them. That's what your Bible says. That's what's going to happen. God doesn't make mistakes. God doesn't lose control. God doesn't mess up. God doesn't call the wrong person. God doesn't send you through hard times that you can't handle and, and then expect you to just figure it out without helping you and blessing you in the end. You're here for a purpose. You have a destiny that's tied directly to God. Let him hear your voice. Turn your pain into power. Thank you, Jesus. And you're not turning your pain into power to blind somebody, not, not for revenge, but for empowerment. God ordained you, placed you in your mama's womb, then he planned your entire childhood out. Nothing just happens. It had to happen. And while the answers may not exist in this present world, live your life so that you can sit down with God and you can ask him all about it. And you can ask God, hey, what was all that about? What happened? And God is going to use that pain. God is going to use that trauma because he got a bigger plan for you. Let us pray with you. We have prayer counselors standing by right now. We have trauma therapists online ready to help you. Everything is going to be all right. After this, everything is going to be all right. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let us pray with you. We have people that's ready to pray with you right now with clean hands. Whatever you're going through, whatever hurt you, it's not too late. We can turn this around. Let us work with you. We want to be a part of this with you. We want to help you through life and navigate navigate all of the spiritual things that you have to deal with. If you don't have a church home, if you don't have a pastor, consider us. Thank you. But right now, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Everything's going to be all right, y'all. It's going to be all right. Right now, you have survived the worst season of your life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All is well, y'all. All is well. It will be all. Trust me with your, with your forgiveness. Yeah, yeah.